So tell me, how did you become interested in gerontology? That is always such an interesting question, and maybe it's the pat answer of how I felt about my grandparents. And um, the thing that was very interesting for me was that I've never been socialized to believe that people die of old age. Mm -hmm. my, I had a brother who died at six. I had an uncle who died at the age of 45. My grandmother died at the age of 79, and my, my, excuse me, my grandfather died at the age of 72. And I never thought of them as dying from old age. Mm -hmm. They died because they got sick. So I just feel incredibly fortunate that I just never equated negative things with old age. Mm -hmm. But I've always preferred to be around people who are older. Um, I loved being around my parents' friends. My mother was 32 mm -hmm. when she had me, so you know my parents were older than mm -hmm. other parents were for kids my age. And um, I just found them so much more interesting. And, and I'd say my grandmother was probably the most influential person mm -hmm. in my life. And why do you say that? I'm, I'm just kidding. I don't, she had a, a way about her of sharing love, acceptance, embracing life. Uh, and yet back at that time, she was a very limited person, not very well educated, I mean, as most people were. But there was just an essence about her, a truth about her that um, I just always admired. And I think if you spend enough time really with anyone, but especially with an older person, mm -hmm. you will get to that essence and that sense of who they are. And that's inspiring. Okay. I, I agree with that. So describe for me your, your career trajectory as a gerontologist. Well, Shannon, that's really interesting because I came into this field late, although I had been working with older adults for a long time. I have never followed the trajectory of a traditional discipline. So I've never been a sociologist, mm -hmm. a psychologist, a biologist. I was an exercise physiologist. Okay. And then I went into higher ed administration. I thought I wanted to be a dean when I grew up. And, um, but administration was always very interesting to me. I love organization and I love creativity. And so um, when I got hired at the University of New England, I, I was hired in my exercise physiology role and actually to run a campus center sports complex. Okay. All right? <laughs> and um, within a year, I had started up a new program called BodyWise Center for Health and Fitness. I have an incredible amount of energy, so if you give me a job that most people think is full-time, uh -huh. for me it's like, no, there's got to be something more. Okay. And, um, and the BodyWise Center for Health and Fitness program, I worked primarily, we had 500 members, worked primarily with older adults that um, had cardiac issues, diabetes, hypertension, joint replacements, mm -hmm. pulmonary issues, you name it. And that was the group that I worked with. Um, I had 60 student staff, I had eight paid staff. This was an auxiliary program where we had to generate the income to, to pay our sal salaries to run the program. And, um, and through that, I, I mean, I, most people with all those conditions are older adults. Uh -huh. And I had a blast. Uh -huh. I had so much fun with them <laughs> and felt incredibly comfortable with them. So I think between that thread through my life where I always loved being with older adults mm -hmm. and then working with them through exercise uh, to help them to feel better, mm -hmm. it, it just kind of solidified it. I had a mentor in my life that told me you need at least five mentors. Okay. And the other thing that she said to me was, do not start your doctoral program until you have a burning question. And I had planned in my administrative, mm -hmm. everything organized way, was that you know I do my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, right. and then my doctoral degree by the time I'm 35. And actually it took me another 10 years before my burning question came up. Okay. Do you wanna know what the burning question yes, was? Please. My burning question was, what is it like to grow old? 
that was my burning question. Pretty broad. It was, okay. but I had a blast. So then, with all that said, at what point in your career do you think you embrace this notion of being a gerontologist to describe yourself? Um, I, I don't know that I ever used the label, mm -hmm. um, but I would definitely say that when I started my doctoral program, okay. that that was my path to be a gerontologist. So that burning question really That did burning it. question did it. Okay. Now yeah. you mentioned this notion of mentorship, kind of mentors being very important and the advice of five mentors. So did you have female mentors who impacted your move into gerontology or maybe your career as a whole? And who were they and how did mm -hmm. you come to them? Well, the first, of course, was my grandmother. Okay. And, um, and I definitely consider her a mentor. And when I answered the question that I need to write about, that I needed to write about, I actually was surprised that I have to say probably all my mentors were women. Wow. Okay. How cool is that? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. there's just something about I've, there's things men have done that I've admired, but I think women just have a skill about them mm -hmm. and a finesse and a. Nurturing. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know that I would use that word. Uh, uh, maybe a sense of self, I guess, mostly that, um, and a burning desire, you know, to kind of move through. So actually, um, an interesting story is uh, Suzanne Kunkel was one of my mentors. I'd say we're more peers now, but uh, there was a time, um, and it was probably 1998. I was in Augie, and Suzanne was the president of Augie, okay. and I went up to her and I said, you are a mentor of mine. In 10 years, I would like to be president of Augie. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me how to attain that? And she laid out the path, and 10 years to the year, mm -hmm. I, I then became Augie president. So that was kind of amazing to me because it wasn't conscious. You know, I wasn't okay. ticking off the years and saying, oh my God, I only have five more years to go. Right. No, it just was a natural process, but I just set that goal and she helped me to attain that. Okay. So that was big. And so is that how you think you've come to your other mentors as well, kind of deciding who you think will help you get to the next maybe place you're looking to go? It's an interesting way, the way you are phrasing that question, mm -hmm. because it, it almost sounds uh, aspiring, competitive to me, and I know that's not what no, you mean. No, not at it, all. It's more of a trait or traits that okay. I admire. Okay. And, um, and of course, things that in some cases, I think I, I see that possibility in myself, mm -hmm. and so I want to emulate, you okay. know, I want to really, um, find what this person is emulating something that really is meaningful to me. Okay. Or, um, yeah, it's usually something I just really admire. Okay. Some people have so much passion, I don't even know what that's about, but their passion just gets me excited. Okay. You know, and then I just kind of take off. It's like, wow, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta find out more about that person. Find out what they're doing. By and large, I will go up to people and say, "You are my mentor," okay. and I have done that with students. There are students that are mentors of mine. Okay. It, they do not need to be older or have certain accomplishments because right. there are people that are just so graceful through life, mm -hmm. and um, and age isn't the factor at all. You, know. you can be inspired by a lot of different people. Absolutely. So what do you think might be, um, what is unique about being a woman gerontologist? We're awesome. <laughs> we're just awesome. Yeah. We get it. We know where we're going. Um, you know, it, it's interesting kind of tying in the, the um, a couple of the questions before mm -hmm. and, and now this question that when I didn't take that traditional trajectory, I never had the mentors that somebody like Suzanne Kunkel had. I didn't know Bernice Newgarten, Ruth Wegg, I mean, M Mildred Seltzer. I didn't know any of these people. I had no idea what gerontology was really about. And so, um, 
Oh, see, I forgot your question, but no, I had it all in my head. No, the question was, what do you think is unique about being a woman? Jane? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, there thank you. you. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so I didn't have the mentors, the traditional mentors in terms of gerontology, okay. you know, the Ruth Wiggs, the Mildred yeah. Self, Bernice Newgarten, and, um, and I had to find my own way, and so oftentimes it was many of my, my peers mm -hmm. that helped me to come into my own around that. And um, I just think that women's energy is so collaborative. Mm -hmm. And gerontology is multidisciplinary, right. that if we're gonna create that collaboration, you know, you need to be at least wired for that to begin yeah. with, and then move in that direction. So I think, you know, being a woman gerontologist is something where you need incredible strength. Mm -hmm. I think you need power. Mm -hmm. And I say that in a very positive way. Yeah. I don't mean in terms of stepping on people, but mm -hmm. um, when I go to a big meeting, I wear red. Red is a power color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's ways of trying to say that um, people mean, I'm always educating about gerontology, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, I think being a woman gerontologist, you think you need to take those really key components of womanhood and then bring that forward into the profession. Right. And I like what you said, it's not about stepping on people because a key element mm. of power is empowering. Absolutely. Okay. And well, no, I'm going to disagree with you there. Okay. Because I don't <laughs> feel that I have the ability to empower someone else. They can only empower themselves. But boy, don't I hope I can open okay. those doors okay. so they can step through okay. and empower themselves. Then. Okay, gotcha. I, I, I would say, though, probably with even your legacy, in lots of ways, you have opened doors and empowered others. So I could see how you could describe that because I've yeah. seen some of that. They've chosen to walk <laughs> through and do it. They've okay. had the self-esteem, the self-awareness to embrace that and move forward. Remember, you know, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. That's true. So, okay. so we'll agree to disagree, or we, we're on the same page? I think we're on the same page Good. more than not. So Good. there we go. <laughs> so how has um, being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? Ah, aha. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's, here's my hobby horse, all right? Okay. Again, coming into this field late. Do you know how many of my peers, men and women, use terms that they are so used to okay. that they haven't thought critically about those? Mm -hmm. Today, during my poster session, I was absolutely nuts at how many times I saw the word geriatric and the word elderly. Uh -huh. Those are both adjectives. Mm -hmm. If you look up geriatric in the dictionary, you will see that that word means significant disorders, a per mm -hmm. person with significant disorders. Yeah. So as soon as we have a geriatric person, a geriatric patient, we are saying we have a person with significant disorders. Mm -hmm. As soon as we use that word elderly, mm -hmm. then we are implying that they are vulnerable, that they have disease or they are frail or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Call them elders, call them older adults, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, it's better off to have them decide what they want to be called, but regardless. So, with that said, I forgot your question again. I must be tired no, too. No, it's okay. I was just asking kind of the connection. Oh, my own, age, my own yeah. old age, yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so with that said, what has happened to me is that I've become very conscious. And the only way we all age the same is chronologically. Mm -hmm. Each year we get a year older, each day we get a day older, yeah. all right? But other than that, it's very heterogeneous, which all of us know in the field. Yeah. And yet, time and time again, people will ask, how old are you, or what is your age? Or mm -hmm. when I present to older adults, every time before they tell me this really cool story, they have to tell me their age. I'm 85 and I hung from the parallel bars in my backyard with my grandchildren. It doesn't matter to me what age you are. You know, I mean, you're doing that, you felt good doing that? Yes, does it matter? No. 
What I teach in the medical school and with other health profession students is attitudinal age. Mm -hmm. What age do you feel? That will tell me far more than if they're 80 or 85. Mm -hmm. So I have a very good friend, Jim. He's 94. We play this game. Jim, how old do you feel today? Marilyn, I feel like I'm 40 today. You know, this is great. And he has trouble moving around, but he mm -hmm. says, if I didn't have to look at myself in the mirror, I would swear I was 40. Mm -hmm. And then another day I might get in touch with Jim and I'll say, Jim, how old do you feel today? And he'll say, Marilyn, I feel 100 today. Mm -hmm. I know something's wrong, you know, and really need to connect with him. Mm -hmm. So in terms of my old age, my own age, ask me about my attitudinal age. Okay. How old do I feel? So how old do you feel today? Yeah, I'd probably feel about 30 today and I'm 60. Okay. Yeah. Like I'm still running marathons, <laughs> I'm, you know, still engaged. It's, those two numbers just don't carry the weight that our society gives them. Mm -hmm. And especially I'm in the medical profession, it, right. it, you know, it's, it's a death sentence mm -hmm. to have higher numbers. Yeah. You know, because right away people presume if you're going to be 75 or 80 or that you have X, Y, and Z. And we just don't allow people the time to adapt, adjust, to Mm -hmm. um, embrace their own aging. And it's just a shame, really. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I, I like that. And the, the comment you made about elder versus elderly. Elderly. I learned that in, in graduate school. And Bless I've been you. pounding that to my students over the years. So I agree. Do you know they're still teaching the disengagement theory? It's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. As the first functional theory of successful aging, it makes me nuts. I know. So, we do have to think more critically about Absolutely. You know, the times we use. Absolutely. So the Wiggle Project, this project is focusing on the legacies of older women gerontologists. <coughs> Within that <coughs> framework, is there anything else you would like us to know, um, maybe about your own legacy or about the legacy of women in gerontology in general? Hmm. I'm trying to think what I wrote about, actually. Ah. Ah. What I would like to have people think about, and it's based on some of the things we were just talking about, mm -hmm. is, um, I don't know if you were in the health science section meeting the other day. You're not health sciences, right? I asked everybody in the audience the question, what is the most powerful three-letter word in the English language? <laughs> okay. Any um, ideas? <laughs> I would, being a gerontologist, probably think age. No, it's but not that. What came to mind immediately was sex. <laughs> Usually I get sex or God, but no, it's not either of those. <laughs> Although I guess it depends who you are. Actually, the most powerful three-letter word in the English language is ass. As soon as we are born, we are asked to breathe. As we're growing up, we are asked to say, mommy, daddy, to do this, to do that. You know, can, can you jump through this hoop? Can you do? We are programmed to respond to questions and to ask. And so, in this field, I would love to have anyone in this field ask critical questions about aging. Why do we need to use the term elderly? Mm -hmm. Why is it that people are uncomfortable with their own aging process? What can we do about that? And to continue to ask really thoughtful and critical questions and try to challenge those past disengagement theory paradigms, you know, move towards zero transcendence mm -hmm. and, you know, have people be able to create their own reality about what their age means to them rather than locking them into a box. Mm -hmm. So that would be the thing that I would want to pass on is for people to ask critical questions and to be more conscious about how they're talking.